All right, so hello everyone. My name is Shreya Agrawal and I will be the host for this evening for this event. And let me share my screen. So, so yeah, I hope you all can see my screen. Um, welcome, welcome to the 30th event of uh, Pi Berlin, and it is our summer event because the summer is here. The sun was shining bright and nice still yesterday, but today is a little bit raining, but I hope the weather will be back. And we are here to have a virtual event yet. We are very sad that this cannot happen in person, but we are working towards it. Uh, before we start the main event, let's have a short introduction about who we are and why Pi Berlin. So the main idea of this was that we all love Berlin and we are, um, most of us are based out of Berlin, but we are welcome to everyone, especially now that the events are virtual. Uh, we are welcome to everyone who has who has an interest in, in Python or wants to share something about Python or learn about it as well. And the Python uh, has a cute story or a made up story that we like to share when the Python reached Berlin, it uh, climbed the TV tower and said, hey Berlin, here I am. And that's why we have a Pi Berlin chapter here. Uh, and like I said, we love sharing ideas and we're welcome to everyone who is interested. Our organizers are Anesthesia, who's handling the streaming platforms and Twitter platforms for us. Myself, who will be the host for some part of the event. Theo, whom you will interact with in the later part. And Lubin, who could not be with us today, but you will see him. If you've been with us, you must have seen him in the previous events. And if you are with us in the next event, then you will see him definitely. He also helps in handling the questionnaire and introduction part of, um, of the uh, organization. Uh, we do not have many rules in general, but one thing that is super important to us, both for the organizers, speakers, and the participants is that we be nice to each other, be patient, be kind, Sometimes technical glitch happens. We are all here to learn and grow. So please be nice. And if you're interested in re reading more about our code of conduct, then please refer to the link mentioned on your screen. It is a very safe place to ask questions because we are all nice to each other. So there is no need to feign surprises or well actuallys or any form of ism such as racism, sexism, or any form of discrimination. Please be very welcome and uh, make this a platform that you would like to attend as well in future. Today's event is sponsored by Scout B and Anesthesia made it possible. So thank you so much, Scout B. They, uh, they helped us have the Zoom platform and uh, we are very grateful for this, um, for, for this collaboration. Today's agenda, we have two speakers today, Duke Farrell, who will be talking about asynchronous code with Python and Ruben Lerner, who would be talking about three paradigms for method inheritance in Python. But before we have this, uh, these amazing talks, we also have some surprise for you. We have collaborated with Manning Publications and they are providing discount codes. So you can use the uh, discount code MTPPYBER21 as mentioned on your screen and get 35% off on a book of your choice. You can also scan the QR code uh, and, and uh, reach out and use this discount code. So go ahead, please use us. And if you do, do, do post about it on Twitter and tag us and let us know that you purchased a book through, through um, Manning Publications. Along with that, we are looking for organizers, especially uh, people who would be interested in handling our social media platforms such as LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. So you don't necessarily be, need to based out of Berlin. But um, if you're interested in tweeting about events or making interesting play cards or some sort or uh, on uh, some, uh, some, something related to LinkedIn as well, so please let us know and we will, uh, we will reach out to you definitely. At the same time, we're looking for speakers who would like to share their projects or ideas with, uh, with our community. When I say speakers, 
Do I mean professional speakers who speak at those, only speak at those fancy conferences? Not really. We definitely welcome people who have anything to share related to Python and want to present their ideas. Also, if you want to just practice your presentation skills, you can use this as a platform to present your projects and we will be happy to coordinate and um, coordinate and uh, set up something that is mutually convenient. We have two formats of talks. That is the uh, long 30 minutes talk and a lightning talk of five to 10 minutes. It is dependent on you if you would like to have Q&A or not. And uh, we are uh, also flexible with the topics, but it has to be something related to Python. So if you're interested, then pre please reach out to us. You can submit your proposal here on the link or you can scan the QR code. You can even just reach out to one of the organizers or message us on Twitter and we will get back to you. When you tweet about us, please uh, tag us. We are on Twitter by the handle Pi Berlin Python. Even during the event today, if you like something or if you would like something for us to improve, please let us know. And uh, when you do so, please again tweet. Uh, don't forget to tag us on Twitter as well. Um, also, a few thank you notes, uh, credits for the free assets and resources. The presentation template was by Slides Carnival and the photographs by Unsplash. And people who helped create this logo and story are Elena Constantin and Christian Barra. So thanks to you two for creating this um, logos and stories that we've been using for almost two years now. And I think uh, we will continue using them for quite some time. So thank you for putting in the effort to create this and uh, lay the groundwork for Pi Berlin. Before we start today's event, we have some awesome events also coming up by our uh, sister platforms. We have the Euro Python coming up and Anastasia, one of our organizers will be speaking there. So the tickets are open. Do if you are interested, do buy it. It is from July 26th to 1st August. So not so far away. And it is an excellent platform to learn and share uh, knowledge about Python. Along with that, we also have Pi Lady Munich hosted by Arculus who have some interesting event uh, planned on uh, 29th of July at 7 p.m. CET. And they also have prizes. The first prize would be a Udemy certificate of 50 euros and second, third prize would be Amazon gift cards. So don't forget to join that event and learn how awesome they are. And we also have a conference by Manning Publications. It's a free one day conference on 3rd August from 12 to 5 p.m on Twitch. So do join them and learn more about them. We are collaborating with them, like I mentioned, uh, uh, for planning publications, and they're also providing a discount code to us. So don't forget to join them for their one day conference. It's, uh, it's going to be very interesting. And now we start our event. And the first speaker is Duke Farrell, who will be talking about asynchronous code with Python. So Duke, over to you. Hi, everyone. Hello, we can hear you. Yeah, oh, good. OK, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, hi. There is no video. Uh, if you would like to have a video on the stream, then you need okay. to turn it on. OK, uh, let's see here. Where did that go? I'm unable to start my video. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. interesting. Give me a second. I'm going okay. to check that. Are you sure? OK, I can try to ask you to do that. Uh, start my video. There we go. There I am. Hi. Cool. Yay. OK. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. All right, terrific. As mentioned, my name is Doug Farrell. I've been developing code for a long time and Python for a little shorter than that, and um, a lot of different domains and industries. So I've been coding for a long time. And uh, 
I want to present today, what we're going to be talking about is um, asynchronous programming with Python, which is um, not the same as parallel programming or um, where you have multiple processes or threading. It's all within a single thread and it kind of works like uh, people do in the real world where we're all, where people are uh, reacting to events and we are as people relatively good task switchers. I don't think we're particularly good at uh, concurrent uh, parallel stuff, but as task switchers, we're pretty good. So we can delegate activities to run on their own and switch our personal context, like our, where we're paying attention between them as need be. So an example of this would be, um, we can drive a car, we could talk with the passenger in the car, remember the next route to take, a lot of other things at once. Um, we can handle these events because they can sort of go on autopilot until various things happen, events occur, like um, some of the person in front of us puts their brakes on and we need to put the brakes on or we need to change lanes, uh, those kinds of things. But um, one of the, as I said, asynchronous programming is not parallel programming. We're switching between stuff. And part of the big advantages is that we can do this is the huge um, the magnitude, orders of magnitude difference between CPU processing and um, IO processing, like reading a file, getting stuff from an API, a REST API, are all far slower than CPU activity. I'm going to use an analogy to help to illustrate uh, building towards uh, an asynchronous demo of using parenting. Um, all of us, some, most of us are parents or have parents. And so you understand how parenting works. As parents, you have to do a lot of things at once. Uh, watching the kids, balancing the checkbook, taking care of things around the house. All those things are progressing uh, at the same time but you're not doing them exclusively. And part of that, we're, part of my demo and the, the stuff that we're gonna see is programming a parent to handle these things in different ways and see how those approaches uh, work. So let's talk about making a synchronous parent. Now this parent wants to get stuff done just like any parent, but they're limited to being, they have to stay with a task all the way to completion. This means that if you're a good parent, that you are watching the kids all the way to bedtime when you can break away to do something else. So let's take a look what that, that kind of parent might look like out of a kind of a timeline. Now what this is trying to show is the activities uh, in that day uh, where the bottom of the graph is going to the right where time is progressing that way and activities that you have to pay attention to are on the uh, vertical axis. So the, the parent activity is the red line and the beginning of the day the parent goes up and is watching the kids all day long until bedtime. And they have to stay with that uh, because it's a synchronous process. This is the synchronous approach to parenting uh, where they stay with the kids all the way until the kids, the kids don't need any more attention. And then they can break, break away and go to the next task and uh, wash some clothes in the washing machine. But they have to stay with the washing machine until that cycle is finished when they can break away and then move those clothes to the dryer uh, and then by the end of the day, uh, they can get back to doing the checkbook, which is a, very, a, demand, a more demanding mental task or CPU task that requires attention, but you can't get to it till all the other tasks are done. Now, I think that uh, you can see the stuff is moving, um, but it's all performed the task serially and makes for a really long day. Um, as you can see, most of the time is spent watching the kids, uh, which is, of course, important. And only after the kids go to bed can you break away to do other tasks. Um, if, you, if you follow this, I think you can see that a few weeks of living like this and most parents would want to jump out the window and run away from home. So let's try a different approach to building a parent that could get some stuff done in some reasonable fashion. We'll build what's called, what I'm calling a polling parent. And the polling parent can break away from tasks on a regular basis to see if any other task needs attention. So this graph shows the same kind of activity, but based on a polling frequency. So the parent line, the red line at the bottom, starts out, gets the kids going, and then goes back to the bottom, checks the washer, gets that going, breaks away after a at a frequency to check the, start the dryer, breaks away, does a little bit of work on the checkbook, breaks away to check on the kids, see if they need attention. You know, if somebody's yelling, there's a fight going on, somebody needs a Band-Aid. They break away and start the cycle again, where they check the washer. In this case, the washer is done. Who knows how long ago it was done, but now they can pay attention to it to unload it. Breaks away, goes back to the dryer, 
same thing, unloads the dryer, loads it with wet clothes, and then once more back to the checkbook. And this goes on until the kids are in bed, the washer and dryer is done, and now that the parent can still uh, break away, poll for other events, but work on the, the checkbook uh, in between those, those polling events. Now again, uh, the, the execution timeline shows that breaking away from a particular task on a periodic basic basis uh, does work because uh, tasks are getting done. It does have some limitations, however. Uh, depending on the polling frequency, a, sequence, a lot of time is spent waiting for tasks to complete. Uh, you're constantly checking on something to be done, and that task may take a long time to be finished. Uh, worse than that, um, the, the frequency of check of polling may not give priority tasks enough attention, like the kids. Uh, if you're checking on the washing machine, the dryer, and the checkbook, uh, and this polling frequency is you know, some realistic number like 15 minutes, it could be 30 minutes to an hour before you get back to the kids, and things could go really wrong, as you all know, uh, with kids playing on their own, and that, that might be a real problem. Now, you can address this partially by increasing the polling frequency uh, that you check on tasks, but more time is spent context switching between tasks and actually getting tasks done. And not, again, I think that this living like this as a parent uh, for any kind of duration would make you want to stop being a parent and run away from home. So let's talk about a threaded parent, uh, creating a threaded parent. Now this, many people would think that the, this approach is the dream come true for parents to be able to clone themselves and have copies of themselves uh, attend to all of the tasks that are in motion. In this case, uh, we're showing, I don't have a, a baseline parent at the bottom of the graph. Each red line indicates a clone of the parent taking care of an individual task. Now this looks pretty good. The kids have a task that, they're, that a parent is paying attention to them full time, all the way to bedtime. Uh, the dryer has a task where a, a parent that's paying attention to it all the way till the dryer is done. The washer, the same thing, the checkbook, the same thing. Now, this seems like it might be a good approach, uh, be able to build a parent like this to address multiple tasks, and it does. Uh, it is a pretty good approach, but it does have uh, things to watch out for. You notice the uh, dryer and washer, the uh, two parent tasks, if the washing machine parent, if the washing machine parent grabs the washer, acquires the, the washing machine, and wants to unload it and load the dryer and tries to it's going to want to try to get a hold of the dryer to load the dryer. At the same time, the dryer parent uh, is unloading the dryer and wants to take clothes from the washing machine to load the dryer. Now, those, if those two things happen in the right sequence, uh, the parent who has the dryer is not going to let it go for the washing machine parent, and the washing machine parent who has the washer is not going to let it go for the dryer parent. And you now have a deadlock where those two parents are uh, locked because they can't access the resource they want to complete their tasks. And unless you handle that, unless you have a mechanism to prevent deadlocks, those things are locked essentially forever. The other thing that happens is because um, the parents, all of these clone parents are sharing resources, um, you have to communicate between the parents to prevent those shared resources from becoming corrupted. For instance, um, if the parent who's watching the kids playing if that one of the kids has an accident and needs to go to a clinic, like something serious happens, that parent is going to take the parent to the, the child to the clinic, and they may have to write a check at the clinic. Let's say it's a Sunday, or who knows, they, their card reader is down. They may have to write a check against the family budget to cover that trip to the clinic. Well, the checkbook parent is unaware of that behavior and could happily write a check that causes an overdraft on the family budget. And that's something with a threading environment that you'd have to take care of. Those two parents would have to communicate with each other in order to prevent uh, essentially the corruption of the checkbook uh, of the family budget by writing a check uh, that overdraws the uh, account. So that's essentially what I'm saying here. Unless handle the, you know, the, unless you handle it, uh, the parents can conflict with each other both by trying to get resources that are shared or, or um, corrupting resources that are shared. So let's take a, take a look at the asynchronous parent. Uh, this is the approach that we're gonna eventually take. And um, what this does is kind of models the way we as people work in the real world. 
So in the asynchronous world, it kind of looks like the polling parent, but you'll notice that the, at the bottom line, the parent line goes up and starts the kids playing, gets them set up to play, and then breaks away, and then starts the washing machine, and breaks away, and starts the dryer, and then goes back to starting to work on the checkbook. Now the checkbook, they're periodically breaking away to see if anything's happened, but they immediately get to go back to the checkbook. So more time is spent on the essentially CPU or parent intensive uh, task, and less time is spent switching or checking between tasks like in the polling event. So now uh, when an event happens, you'll see that the event, the washing machine dings, it's done. The parent breaks away, sees the event, finishes the, the washing machine task, goes back to the checkbook. Then there's an event at the, with the kids playing, it's bedtime. Um, and the, that parent is able to break away, respond to that event and take, put the, get the kids to go to bed, get, get them into bed and get to sleep. Then they break away. The next event is the dryer is complete. And so they finish that task. And then they're free to work on the checkbook task, but periodically checking on events to see if anything else needs attention. Well, the other tasks are complete. And unless the kids wake up and need attention, uh, they're able to essentially work more or less nonstop on the checkbook task. So this, I think the results of the, this asynchronous parent analogy um, handles tasks pretty well and models the behavior of a real parent in the real life. Uh, the success of this model is the ability to delegate tasks and respond to events that they produce. The events are like the washing machine and dryer making tones when the cycles are done, or like the kids uh, having an event like crying or hurting themselves or yelling or a fight that needs attention. All of these tasks, because they can be delegated and they can run on their own, more or less unattended until an event occurs means that you can attend to uh, the checkbook task that can't be delegated and has to have attention to it in order to move, um, move forward. So in Python, we kind of do the same thing. Uh, when we're programming a Python program to be asynchronous, we're taking advantage of the big difference in time uh, that CPU instructions could get done versus IO instructions. Um, so CPU bound tasks are like wrong running calculations, compression algorithms, code that requires the CPU to be executing instructions. IO bound tasks are like making HTTP requests, like a REST request, uh, reading or writing a file, uh, any kind of a code that makes a call to the OS, but the CPU has to wait for that IO to finish uh, in order to move on. So there's a difference there, what's going on. We could take advantage of how slow IO tasks are versus how fast CPU tasks are. So I'm gonna ha I have a couple programs that we're gonna run through just some examples that demonstrate building towards an asynchronous uh, task or program that uses asynchronous Python. So I have, uh, there are a couple of examples for them. There's an IO task and a CPU task that take time to complete based on the parameters passed to them. Uh, all the example programs sort of follow this model. A queue contains the tasks to run along with the parameters to, pa to pass to those tasks. There are one or more worker functions that pull tasks from the queue and run them with the associated parameters. The worker will continue to pull work from the task, task queue until it's empty. And then there's a main function that is essentially a loop uh, that runs, it's kind of like a, it's an engine that runs the process, runs all these workers and tasks until completion. Uh, yeah, this is just a list of more of those, more details about each of the programs and how, they, how they're set up. And let's see, why don't we, yeah, the example programs, if you wanna follow along are in this GitHub repository, which is public. So you can see the example programs that I put together. So why don't we uh, switch to the example programs? Can you guys see my uh, screen okay and read the code? Yes, they cannot okay. unmute themselves, but they can write something. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this first program, all it's doing, it has one worker um, that is gonna, I have, what I've done is I've created a, a factorial function that create, that calculates the factorial. This is essentially a CPU intensive uh, work that's gonna get done. I have an IO task 
all it does is it just delays. It's simulating an I.O. function by just using the sleep, a sleep delay. The delay is the parameter that's passed to this function. Uh, the CPU task uses, just calls the factorial program to run some CPU intensive work. And then this worker is the thing, well, we could only, we only really care about the, the bottom here. This guy, it just has, he does some reporting on what it's doing. And while the queue, this task queue is what's passed to him, it's a queue, just a regular Python queue that we pass the, the task to perform and the parameters that task expects. So we get the function and the, uh, the keyword arguments as a dictionary from the queue, call it, print the results. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of a, it's an overall complicated way to run a function inside of a loop. Uh, then the main function, which is the engine for all this, uh, create the queue, put some stuff in the queue, and then this is just putting the task to run and the parameters it should run with as a list of um, tuples. And then we create one worker. So we have one worker, it's just the worker function. Uh, we name it one, and then we pass it the queue where it's going to get work from. Now we run the workers. Inside of a loop, uh, we just get a worker from, we get a worker from the queue, the queue, or from the, excuse me, from the list. Get the worker function, the name, the queue, et cetera, pass that all to the worker function. And when it's done, uh, we remove that worker from the queue. Now, if you notice, I'm using this, um, this little context manager. This is a, a timing context manager written by a friend of mine at Real Python. And all it does is it provides a, a lapse time functionality for how long this, loop, this little loop will run to give us some um, statistics on what, how, how, it, how well my application is running and how long it takes to run. And we'll see how this is useful when we start to see asynchronous behavior. So nothing very exciting here. If I run this program, worker one is starting, he's got a four second delay. He picked up the next task, which was the uh, factorial. And he takes approximately 10 seconds to complete, which is about the sum total of our delays here in the uh, array. The factorial effect, uh, completes so quickly, it almost doesn't count inside of the delays. So as I said, this is an overly complicated way to run, uh, to, to, to run a bunch of things in a loop. But let's try adding Let's try adding a second worker. Same code, same, all this stuff is exactly the same. The only change is now I have two workers. I have worker one and worker two. And here I'm going to, while I have workers, I'm going to iterate over them and do stuff. Call those, make them run, call their tasks, pass the parameters. So let's see what happens uh, when we run this. Make sure I didn't hose that up. I did. There we go. So we'll run this. Worker one is starting. Looks exactly the same so far. Only worker one is doing anything. But at the bottom, you see worker two starting to run tasks. So, and then it completes immediately because there are no tasks. Well, why is that? Well, it's because worker one uh, does not know how to share share with worker two. It's a synchronous process. So he, com he consumes the entire task, task list right there himself. And by the time worker two gets to run, that queue is empty and there's nothing to do. So let's take a look at worker three. So this guy is going to actually, now I'm gonna teach work, the workers how to share uh, the processing power. So they can, they can context between the two, they can context switch or multitask between the two to run back and forth between each other. So we have the factorial, we have an IO task, nothing changed there, CPU task, same, just calls the factorial. The worker, however, is now a generator. If 
by adding a yield in here, he gets something, he gets a task off the queue, and then he yields right away. So this makes this function a generator and kind of a coroutine because he can be re because this yield happens inside of the loop, he can be restarted multiple times until the until the loop is complete when the task is empty. So he's able to yield back to the engine that's running this stuff. Otherwise, the same, create the queue, put some tasks in the queue. Now the difference here in the side of the engine, while we have workers in the queue, we have to, because these are generators, notice that instead of just passing in like in example two, let's see, we go down here, where we have, we have a worker, we pass it the function and then its parameters. In this example, we actually invoke the worker because it's a generator function and we need to kick it off. And inside of the engine, the event engine, we call the next operator on that or the next function on that worker. This is what how we pass control back to that function when it when it returns from a yield, which it does it does immediately here on line 80 and 81. But then we get the pass control back to it here, and it will keep being passed back until that loop inside of the worker ends. We get a stop iteration, and then we can remove the worker from this list of workers. So now that gives us a chance to essentially context switch between worker one and worker two. So let's see how that works. And I see worker one and worker two are both running. They're both started. So worker one, um, worker two completed the, the um, factorial task immediately. And then he picked up another test. So now they're busy and they're switching off between who handles what task, but you'll notice there's no change in the total time it takes to complete the program. It's still around 10 seconds, which is the total time of the tasks in here. So we haven't seen an improvement. We've seen a, a very fancy way to context switch between two tasks, but otherwise it's still just a for loop. It's a synchronous for loop. So let's take a look at ex uh, example four. Now we're gonna to start to use Python's asynchronous behavior. By importing the asynchronous IO module, we now can create asynchronous programs. What this means is that we can break away from IO functions and let the CPU continue to run and do other things. So now in my factorial uh, function, I've made this asynchronous. And I've done that partly because I want to be able to, I want to be able to periodically, every 10 iteration, iterations of my um, inner function, I want to tell them, I want to say I'm context switching. I want to context switch using this async IO sleep. All this does sleep zero, all this does is it switches essentially yields in async IO terms back to the engine so that it could do something else. The IO function does the same thing. In this case, however, I call async IO sleep with a delay. So if I say, give me an async IO sleep of two seconds, it immediately yields back to the controlling loop. And I get, a, I get an event two seconds later that the sleep is done. So this is like, this is still like waiting for an IO operation to finish. My CPU task, uh, all it does is it uses a wait. The await function is what you have to call along with designating the function as an async function. The await function says, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for factorial to be finished because it is an asynchronous function. And then the worker function, same kind of thing. I'm awaiting on the task queue because the task queue is, you'll see later, is also an async IO task queue. So I wait to get something off there. So if there's nothing in the queue, I don't block I immediately go back to the event loop so it can do other stuff until the, an event occurs, which means there's something in the queue. Same thing, I await for the function it's called because those functions are now asynchronous. And the main program, the list of tasks looks the same, but now we're into a different uh, engine. We've got a different function. We're awaiting 
on a, a async IO gather. And what this does is it pulls together multiple asynchronous uh, tasks, which are our workers, uh, kind of like, a, well, they call them coroutines, but they're like the generator from the previous example. But they are creating those coroutines and pulling them together. So it's not going to complete this section right here from 80 to 84 is not going to complete until both of those things are finished. Now, in order to run this, run this code, I use, I've made my main program, sorry, asynchronous because it's running asynchronous code. And in my main function, I call that asynchronously using this async IO run method. Now let's see what this looks like. I, I, granted, I understand that this looks like, holy smokes, what's going on here? But let's see what the benefit of this kind of work is. So we'll go to four. Now you see this context switch to event loop? That's our factorial context switching back to our function, our uh, main function engine here. Oops, our main function engine here. Now the big deal is notice how the time taken is uh, is five seconds. So we're our IO or the time delay, the sleep delay is being overlapped. We still have a total time delay of 10 seconds to get through. But now the tasks are running asynchronously. So there's two, there's two time delays running on top of each other. So our total time is about half. So let's take a look at, we're gonna create, now we're gonna move on to a program. I'm kind of going back to being synchronous because now we're going to create a program that uh, gets it it does gets http gets to uh, various websites to pull down that first page and that's the that's the io that we're going to wait for and this is a synchronous model using the request library uh, that's a great library for doing this kind of stuff but it's not asynchronous our factorial program is back to being the synchronous version the io task now uses the requests module to make a call to the data that's passed to it for the URL to download. Our CPU task, same, still doing factorial work. The worker now is getting the function and the, uh, the keyword arguments from the task queue. It's doing a yield, so it's sharing, it's a generator, it's still sharing back to the main loop. And I'm doing this, uh, I'm checking the name of the task to see what parameters I should get and the reporting that I should do from it. Just if it's an IO task, it gets a URL and the text of that URL and prints that, a piece, prints a piece of it. If it's the factorial task, it just prints the factorial. Our main program is again back to being a synchronous model, but now the task list is filled with a URL and the URL that you, the URL that you want. Uh, to get as the parameters being passed to those tasks. So if I run this program as five, so we'll open this up. The tasks are running and it took 4.38 seconds to get pull, essentially pull down those uh, URLs. Now, because this is a synchronous model, the two workers are sharing the task queue. So they're doing one, one worker will get um, one URL, the next worker will get another URL, the next worker will get another URL, but those are synchronous. They're essentially serial. So it's this 4.38 seconds reflects the, the cumulative time to take to download those web pages. So let's take a look at an asynchronous version of the same thing. Now it's essentially doing the same thing, but in an asynchronous manner. We can't use requests because it's not an asynchronous uh, library. We are gonna do async IO. And then we use a module called AIO HTTP, which is a way to do asynchronous HTTP requests. Our factorial is back to being um, async ready. Our IO task also is now coded in an async friendly way. So it's an async function. It calls this AIO HTTP client session, which is uh, creates a creates a connection session. 
as a context, as a, excuse me, as a context manager, then it creates another context manager to actually get the response of, from the URL. So it's going to um, make a call to that URL, but in an asynchronous manner. So it doesn't wait for it to complete. Within the context manager, I get the text. I wait for that text to come back. And then I re report back to the worker with the results of that of the URL and the text that I got for it. CPU task is again uh, set up as a asynchronous function. And then the worker is pretty much the same. It does it gets the function and the keyword arguments, checks the, the function name to see what's the right thing to do to get off the queue and to report about it. Uh, the queue is the same as the synchronous model that we just saw. And we're back to now the async version of uh, gather, which pulls these two workers together uh, so that this, this code won't complete until both those workers complete and async IO run. And so let's take a look and see what this, uh, what this does. So we go to example six. Same thing, but notice now the total time of execution is about half of the previous total time. So those IO functions of getting the web pages are overlapped on top of each other. And it's a great, it's a great way to, if you have a program that's IO bound, this is a great way to take advantage of that and overlap that kind of functionality. Let's, let's make a quick change here and see what happens. I don't think it's gonna be a big advantage. But if I add a third worker, So we'll run this program again. Cut it to get almost in half again. By having that third worker, it's able to now do three IO connections at the same time. Oops. So one of the things, that the asynchronous use cases, this kind of programming is really powerful if you've got IO bound applications. So like the pros of this, if you have an, a, a, a pro, an application that is a mixture of CPU and IO operations, you could benefit a lot from using this kind of style of programming. If you need to perform multiple IO per, uh, operations sim simultaneously, like you need data from several different places to complete an operation, again, this is a great way to do that. It also is kind of simpler uh, to do a uh, develop an asynchronous application over threading or polling because um, those have a lot of complexity, like setting up a breaking away from an application to do polling can get complicated. And I don't know about you, but I've done, I've written threading applications and they're hard to get right and easy to get wrong and very hard to debug. Uh, whereas a, an asynchronous application, although it seems to be doing things in the threaded model, it's only, it is, it is a single thread and you have complete control over when the application breaks away to the event model. So it's a little bit easier to understand and debug. Now there are use cases where an asynchronous application doesn't fit. If you have a CPU intensive application uh, that's gonna like computing a spreadsheet or compressing uh, graphics, you're not gonna see any benefit from an asynchronous model because there is no, I, there's not a lot of IO going on there that you can delegate and react to events to. Uh, asynchronous programming does not take advantage of multiple CPU cores. It's a single core application that is task switching at great speed. Um, it's a little bit more complex to create an asynchronous application over a synchronous one. It is a little bit more complex. I wouldn't say it's horrendous. Uh, I don't find it as complex a thread, as a threaded model, but it, it is a little bit more complex. But otherwise, I think it's a great solution if you've got I.O. that you want to get. Anyway, uh, any questions? You can find me here, and that's, that's my uh, email and my LinkedIn profile. Give me a second. I'm meeting people. So, um, yes. I'm going to okay. sharing. Thanks for the great talk, Doug. Um, this Hope is a, too long. No, it was it was okay. Uh, this was, a, I think, a very thorough and uh, accessible introduction to AsyncIO. 
And um, if anyone has any questions right now, please feel free to leave them in the chat. Or if you're on Zoom, you can also just unmute yourself and, um, and ask any questions to Doug. I think we have a first one in the Twitch chat. Uh, GoDev says, uh, my question is, consider we have a big Django project written in a traditional way and the team wants to migrate or rewrite the project using async. Is it a good idea? Why do, you, why do we need async if we already solve our problems until today? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, if you're using the Django, um, you're probably so already solved many of your own problems. And there's not, unless there's a reason, a really clear reason, which uh, is hard to state, to move to rewrite it as an asynchronous application, there's probably no reason to do it. The Django handles multiple requests uh, through threading or whatever. So you don't need to do that. But um, one thing you could think about is, does your Django application serve uh, a web application or is it serving an API uh, or both? I've, I've, I'm currently working on an application on my job where they have uh, you know, a web application with a, with a the browser front end that it serves. And it also serves up an API that other applications access. If you have that kind of thing, it might be worth considering breaking the API out into a separate uh, asynchronous application. An asynchronous application in that from something like something like the Fast API framework can really serve many, many, many simultaneous connections. Uh, I think much better than the Django can. And plus, you get you take the load off the Django app and put it, you know, in, a, in an app that it's uh, in the right domain, so it has one single single area of concern. And Rodrigo was asking on the Zoom talk, what if fulfilling requests needs to do several IO bound tasks? That would be when async await makes sense, no? Yes, if you have several IO tasks that are uh, that you need to gather the results of all of them to perform some function, like you're merging user data with uh, their account or the, the order stuff that they're ordering on a, on a system, then yeah, you, you could definitely benefit by doubling up the IO. You put all of the IO in, in the gather statement in, from my example program. And um, you, when that gather statement goes is finished and proceeds to the next step, all of the IO is complete and you have all of the data and you can proceed. So they, it's a nice way that those things could overlap. And what happens is that the whatever the longest IO thing is, that's how long the statement takes rather than the accumulation of all three of them, for instance. And here comes another one that could be a good textbook to go deep on this topic with good examples like yours. Well, it, uh, I don't actually know of a good textbook that, that talks about asynchronous stuff. There's a lot of uh, data out there. If you look at the Talk Python to Me podcast, there's, a, there's some episodes that talk about that. If you go to the realpython.com uh, website, they also have a lot of information on there. I wrote I wrote a, an article a couple of years ago on asynchronous IO that's a sort of similar to what I presented today. Uh, but those those resources, it's not. Um, I haven't seen a book dedicated entirely to that, but there are resources on the web that you can find. Okay, seems we're not lacking questions uh, uh, tonight. The next one is: What is your suggestion to handle CPU-based tasks like doing a model prediction during a request time when creating a microservice in Python which handles concurrent requests. Uh, that's a, that's a, that presents a lot of interesting opportunities. I think if you have a CPU intensive tasks and maybe there's multiple, there's opportunities where you wanna do multiple CPU intensive tasks. I think a better way to handle that is with a, a message passing system using um, or multi -pro the multi-processing model, but I kind of like the messaging system. If you use something like zero MQ or rabbit MQ to set up a messaging system and then have other processes that um, multiple processes that can handle those CPU intensive tasks and then give you data back through the messaging system. That's a pretty good way to go. There's no advantage in, you know, with the Gil, there's not a lot of advantage to uh, doing threaded code in, in Python that are that is CPU intensive, unless there's really clear um, C libraries in there that relink that let go of the kill. 
but I think that those, like I said, threaded applications, I've, I've lived to regret writing threaded applications. <laughs> Okay, and here's another one from Rally63 on Twitch. Would the talk uh, Concurrency Isn't Parallelism by Rob Pike be a good talk to watch? Probably so. I, I don't know that one in particular, but I'm sure it would be. It sounds like the title sounds uh, enticing. I'm going to check it out myself. And Thomas asks, uh, what is the lowest version of Python uh, the example runs with? I ran my version, and I should have mentioned that, my version in uh, Python 3.9.2. But I believe you can go as far back as 3.6. I, I'd have to check on that. But AsyncIO has been in Python since, since about 3.6. I would go with later versions, though, if you can. <laughs> Okay, then I think uh, we're done with the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Doug, for the talk and for taking your time to answer uh, people's questions. Um, we're very happy to have Ruven M. Lerner today at Pi Berlin. Ruven is a full-time Python trainer teaching courses all around the globe. Uh, Python Workout is his most recent book. Go and check that out if you're looking for a good exercise book. Currently, he's also working on a similar exercise book, but focused on pandas called Pandas Workout. Uh, he has a popular newsletter called Better Developers. Um, I know I've personally learned a lot from Ruben's videos and newsletter, and I'm very happy to welcome him at Pi Berlin. Ruben, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Theodore. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. I guess it's evening for me, too. That's good. Um, so I am going to be talking now uh, about what I call three paradigms for Python method inheritance. Let me share my screen so you can actually see what I'm talking about. There we go. So that should be nice shared and hopefully at a reasonable size for you to understand it as well. Um, and I typically don't use slides in my talks. Also, when I'm doing my training, I do live coding and I'm doing live coding into the Jupyter Notebook. And this is going to be synchronized to my GitHub repo. So I'm actually going to just copy this link here. I'm going to pop this into the chat, which of course disappears. There we go, and we'll send it to everyone. Okay, excellent. So basically that will be updated about once every um, minute or two. By the way, I'm just hearing some, some noise that everyone can mute other than, uh, other than me. <laughs> Um, basically, so this should be updated every minute or two um, automatically while I'm uh, doing the talk, and then afterwards it'll stick around. So uh, if you want to go back and look at anything I've done, you're welcome to do that. So what I want to walk through here is, as I call it, like three paradigms for Python method inheritance. And I find that many people are kind of confused by object-oriented programming, and they're especially confused by this whole inheritance thing. And in many ways, they're confused because they think it's more complicated than it has to be. And in some ways, they're uh, confused because they don't understand how it all fits into how Python thinks and how Python works. Um, and if you understand a few basic rules, you can then understand how inheritance works. And then you can see that there are really only, well, three ways to do inheritance. Um, and I'm talking about sort of general technical ways. Obviously, it can be used in many, many different ways. So what I want to do is start off then with a little example um, of where we might want to use inheritance. And then little by little, we're going to sort of improve upon some bad code, taking really bad code and making it less bad and less bad until we have something that I think demonstrates not only how inheritance works well in Python, but also these different paradigms that I'm talking about. Um, and I'm super, super happy to get questions uh, while I'm talking. If we need to all like, like push that off for a little bit afterwards, and afterwards, obviously, we have to talk about it as well. So let's take one of the most well-worn, uh, tired uh, uh, um, examples that people use in object-oriented programming. Let's say that we have a person class. And so how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to say here, class person. I'm going to define a new class. Of course, a new class is a new type. I'm creating a new type of data in parallel with strings and lists and dictionaries and everything else. Just the difference is that I'm creating it. I am in control. <laughs> and I'm going to say your def dunder init name. Well, self and name, that's kind of important. Self dot name equals name. Then we'll say your def greet self. We'll say return hello self dot name. 
And then I'll say here, P1 equals a person, and we'll say name one. And I'll explain what I'm doing in just a moment, P2 equals person name two. And I'll say print of P1 greet, and I'll say print of P2.greet. So what have I done here? Let's go through this little by little. Well, first of all, I've created a new class. Once again, I've created a new type of data. And when you create a new class in Python, you generally want to create a dunder init method. Now, contrary to what many people believe, this dunder init method is not the constructor. It does not create a new object. Rather, that's taken care of by a different method called dunder new. We won't really go into that right now. The job of dunder init is to add new attributes to our new instance. Meaning the instance of person has already been created. It is passed to Dunder in it. And automatically before we actually get it back, when we create that object, Dunder in it has a chance to add new attributes to it. And attributes are what we use in Python for sticking data onto objects. Um, they are instead of uh, instance variables or instance variables in Python are implemented as attributes, but class variables are implemented as attributes as well. Methods are implemented as attributes as well. Every single object in Python has attributes. And so what we're doing here is saying, hey, this new person object, I want to add a new attribute to it. And that attribute is going to be called name. And what's going to be based on? It's going to be based on the parameter name that we got here. And so it's also important to remember that this name here is a variable, a local variable. And this name here is not a variable, it's an attribute. It's like a private dictionary on self. Self being, of course, the new object that was created. And this is one of those things that people both love and hate in Python, uh, mostly hate, but you get to love it over time. Uh, I promise you within 20 years, it'll make sense to you. But self is the object on which we are working. That is our new instance. And it has to be, always has to be the first parameter in every method that we define. Okay, so Dunder in it here is just gonna take whatever name we pass to it and it's gonna stick it onto that object. Great. Then we define another method, and this is the greet method. And the greet method here is only going to get self. It's only going to get the current instance as its argument. And then what are we going to do? We're going to grab self.name from there and say print hello. We're going to then create a new instance of person, calling it name one. Another instance of person, calling it name two, because I'm like super creative. I'm calling them name one and name two and assigning them to variables p1 and p2. And then finally, finally, we can say print p1.greet, print p2.greet, phenomenal. As we can see, I have now like, created one of the greatest objects ever in the history of computing, and we can have our people greet each other, and all is good. And so my company very happily uh, you know, ships this software, and we're raking it in, and suddenly, you know, after, after, you know, well, I guess not suddenly, after we've been making lots of money and everyone's enjoying themselves, my boss comes in and says, listen, good news, and not such terrible news, but they're kind of bad news. The good news is that our software is indeed a huge success. The bad news is that our customers want more. <laughs> That's the thing with customers, they always want more. And our customers now want a new type of object, one that's really, really similar to the person object that we've already created. And they want to have an employee object. And I say to my boss, you got it. Give me a month and this will be ready. My boss says, sounds, sounds totally reasonable, right? How long could it possibly take? A month sounds great. And I think to myself, ha, once again, I fooled my boss. I am going to take, you know, five minutes to do this and I'll sit around for a month, you know, checking out Twitter or whatnot. So how am I going to do this? So this is like our base object here that we're creating. So I'm now going to create, I'm now going to like, you know, put this in, uh, you know, just put it in a new cell here. So I'm gonna create my class person again with all this, but then I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna say now class, well, what? I wanna have class employee. Now let's just think about what my manager said. My manager said that employee is almost exactly like a person. So almost exactly like a person, um, in what way? Well, it's gonna be exactly like a person in fact, except that the employee has something that a person, a regular person does not. The employee has something that every employee loves to have everyone know that they have, and that is an employee ID number, right? Oh, those of you who work somewhere, I'm sure that's like the, the love of your life. So I, as a good programmer and a good experienced programmer, what do I do in order to implement that? I copy and paste. I say here, I've got class person. Here, I'm gonna say class employee, and I'm gonna say self name and ID number. And I'll say self.id number equals ID number. And then I'll say here like, uh, you know, E one equals employee. Oh, actually I just learned this trick a few days ago. Watch this. I'm gonna say here, duh, 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 
Not can this work? Oh no, I have to use the mouse. Watch this. Da, 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 da. Employee. Pretty snazzy, huh? Oh, I shouldn't have done that last part. Now, how do I get out of that? I'm not sure. Okay, I guess I pressed escape. There we go. I can do it again because I'm doing it. There we go. Amp one. Ta da! Nothing up my sleeve, folks. And now I can say E1 and E2. So what do I have now? I have class person. Oh, I have to do that. Amp1 and 1 and M2 and 2. So what have I done now? I've created this class person that we already saw, but now I've created a class employee, which is super similar to person. How do I create that similarity? Copy and paste. And now E1, E2, everyone is happy. Everything is good. We run it and all is great. And I feel super proud of myself for having done this in record time. Um, and I sit around, as I said, checking out Twitter or you know, playing video games, whatever. Anyway, my boss comes back about a month later because you know, managers always check the code that their employees wrote. And my manager looks at this and says, what, what, what kind of nonsense is this? What kind of nonsense have you written here? Why didn't you use inheritance? I say, oh, right. And my boss says, why do I send you to courses on Python if you're not gonna use the stuff that you learned in the class, you do pay attention to those classes, right? I say, oh, of course I do, of course I do. Um, anyway, I said to my boss, listen, give me another month and I promise I'll get it working right. My boss says, okay, that sounds totally reasonable and off they go. So how can we make this better? What can we do to improve this? Well, we are gonna use inheritance, but what does inheritance mean? What does inheritance mean? And there is the general philosophical idea of inheritance in computer science. And then there's the practical nitty gritty that we have in Python. So the general idea in computer science and in object-oriented programming is for inheritance, I can say that one class inherits from another class. So a class inherits, let's do it this way, inherits from another class. If the parent class Right, so we can say if the child class is just like the parent class with a few small differences. That's basically how we can think about it and how we can discuss it. So if you have two totally ridiculously different classes out there, for example, if you have a car and a pizza, you really cannot say that the pizza class inherits from the car class or the car class inherits from the pizza class unless you have very odd tasted pizzas or very odd tasting cars. In fact, what we usually want to apply is for inheritance, we apply the is a description. So we can say, can, you know, can we say pizza is a car? Probably not, right? Can we say car is a pizza? No. Right, I don't think in either case. So there's no inheritance there. There might be though, a different relationship. And that's the has a. We could say a car has a pizza, right? That makes sense. We can have a pizza inside of a car. And so these are the two relationships we can think of. We have the is a and we have the has a, and these are totally distinct. And in my experience, people have studied object-oriented programming in university, somehow come out with the sense that if I have two classes then, and there's a relationship between them, it must be an is a relationship. There must be inheritance going on. And this is totally not the case. It's true in certain cases. Often, in fact, most of the time you're gonna have a has a relationship, otherwise known as composition one object inside of another. In fact, look at our person object. The person has a name, right? And the employee has a name and has an ID number. So those are two composition relationships, object inside of an object. But we could say, can we say employee is a person? Yes. I mean, don't think of that jerk of a coworker who works at your plant, like your company. In general, employees, we can say are people. So now what? Now what are we gonna do with this? Well, now I'm gonna start using inheritance. So I'm gonna like put this in a new, new cell here. So watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say here that employee inherits from person. What does that mean? What does that do? Well, before we can talk about that, let's go back and talk about what happens when I even call a method in Python. When I call a method in Python, we are asking, we are asking uh, for the attribute greet on P1. 
But wait a second, what is greet? Greet is a method. And where was greet defined? Greet was actually defined on the class. So when I say p1.greet, something here is not adding up. Something here does not make sense. Let's go back for a moment here. I'm going to put this above here. If I say S equals A, B, C, D, can I say S dot upper? You bet I can. I'm calling the upper method on S. But that's not really what's happening. Really, Python is rewriting that to be stir upper on S. See what's going on? That S here, the instance of the string, is being pushed into the parentheses as the first argument. And it is being replaced here by its class. This switcheroo happens every single time you call a method on an instance in Python, every single time. And so that's what self comes from, right? When I call a method in Python, when I say p1.greet, what's actually happening? This is really being turned into person.greet of p1. And this is being turned into person.greet of p2 every single time. But how? How is Python doing that? What's going on there? So basically, let's go through our person and employee as we had it as we had it before, and then we're going to add inheritance to it and see what happens there. Let's get rid of that. I don't know why it's red there. Okay, fine. I'll deal with it. All right. So I create the class person. That class person, the class, has two attributes, dunder in it and greet. That's right. That's right. Classes are objects in Python, and classes have attributes also. And among those attributes are methods. So then we create a new instance of person, we create a new, another instance of person, all good. Now we say p1.greet. And what does Python do? Python looks around for an attribute. It says, does p1 have greet? The answer is no. So then it says, does person have greet? And the answer is yes. It retrieves that, does the switcheroo, and then calls the method. That's what's going on here every single time. And this is part of a larger way that I like to describe attribute lookup is what I call ICPO, instance, class, parents, and then object. It's a little confusing because object, we can say like, you know, object, the class, I guess we can say. All right, what does this mean? It means that when I ask when Python asks an object, does it have an attribute? The first place we look is the instance. Does that object have the attribute we're looking for? If the answer is yes, that's it, we stop. But if it doesn't, then we continue looking and we look on the class. This is how every single method works in Python. Every single one, because we call the method on the instance, but it's actually defined on the class. Okay, so far so good, but Let's now include our employee class. I've now said that employee inherits from person. If I do nothing, nothing else other than employee inherits from person, will it work? Yes. Have I really changed anything? No. Why do I say that? Well, let's go through it now. I create my class. I define my class employee. And the only thing that this inheritance thing has said basically means is if you don't find an attribute on the class employee, then keep looking on person, keep looking up one level. So here, I create a new instance of employee. When I create a new instance, basically Python says, hey, E1, do you have a dunder in it? And the answer is no. You know, does E1, let's do it this way, has in it? The answer is no. So then it looks on E1's class, which is employee. Does employee have in it? The answer is yes, so that's what runs. And then once again, does E2 have in it? No. Does employee have in it? I can't spell tonight. Yes. All right, so basically what we see here is this ICPO in action. First we go to the instance, it's not there. Then we go to the class, it is there. And we do the same thing with greet. Does E1 have greet? No. Does employee have greet? Yes. Same thing with E2. I'm not going to type it again. So really and truly, the fact that we used in, uh, um, uh, inheritance here added nothing, nothing whatsoever. So let's make it worthwhile now. Now let's make it worthwhile. I'm just gonna get rid of all these comments here, which are just taking up space. Actually, I guess I'll keep the ICPO thing. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say this. Well, wait a second. 
Greet in person and greet an employee are precisely the same. What happens if I get rid of greet for employee? Will things still work? And the answer is yes, they will. Hello, name one, hello, name two. Hello, emp one, hello, emp two. What's going on? Well, once again, we've got the whole init thing going. We're gonna come back to that in just a moment. And then Python says, does E1 have greet? No. Does employee have greet? No. So now we go instance does not have it. Class does not have it. Let's go up to the parent. And the parent is person. Does person have greet? Yes. And so it is the greet method in person that is running. So now we can say paradigm number one, do nothing and use the parents method, right? This, this is very popular among my children, right? Basically, don't do anything. Let the parents take care of it. All right, don't tell them I ever said that. In any event, the idea is that if our class works exactly the same for this method as the parents class, do nothing, don't define the method at all. And by not defining the method, via the ICPO rule, Python will get to the parent class. Okay, now let's make this more exciting. So some of you, you poor things, might have experience with say Java or C++ or C Sharp. I know, I know, it's painful, but might be the case. In any event, you might be thinking, wait a second, there's another place that we can save ourselves here because, you know, or save ourselves some, some, you know, make things more efficient. Because look at this, in it, an employee is setting name and in it, in person is also setting name. So here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to remove the assignment to name in in it for employee. Guess what folks, bad news. That does not work well. It ends in horrible, terrible uh, exceptions. What we're being told here is name one, name two, that works great. So our person object is still working great, but employee, it says the employee object has no name. Now I know, I know those of you who work at big companies, it might feel that way sometimes, but that's what's going on here. What's going on here? So let's think about this. When I create my new instance of employee, Python says, does E1 have Dunder in it? The answer is no. So it goes to, does employee, you know, let's do it this way. Does employee have Dunder in it? The answer is yes. That method is invoked. And only that method is invoked. And this comes as a big surprise for people coming to Python from other languages, from like statically compiled languages, in which basically what we have is, um, you can think of a class definition as a set of statements, a set of declarations. Every object of this type will have the following fields defined. And so a class definition, and a subclass definition are merged together. So you get all the fields for the parent class and all the fields from the subclass. That's not how it works in Python. Dunder in it is actually a method that must run in order to add its attributes. These are not declarations. These are things that must actually run. And so what we did here was we had our Dunder in it. It did not assign name. And as far as Python's concerned, that's fine. We don't have to do the same thing as our parents. Again, don't tell my children I said that. But basically our employee object here, it set ID number, it never set the name and that was fine until here. But then what happened? Then what happened is we called e1.greet. What happens when I call e1.greet? Well, it says, does e1 have greet? No. So does e1's class employee have greet? The answer is no. So does e1's class's parent person have greet? Yes. So what happens? We go to greet in parent, in the parent here in person. It says, okay, self object of type employee what is your attribute name? And that's when we discover the attribute was never set. That's why we get that error here. It says here, employee has no attribute name because it's true, but the only time we get an error is at runtime when we have actually tried to use that attribute and it's not there. So this is pretty disastrous and catastrophic and horrible and all sorts of other bad things I can say. 
So what do we do about this? Well, we have to make a decision and we can decide a few different things. One thing we can decide is we can say, uh, well, remember, in it in person, I'm sorry, in it in employee is not like going on and doing anything with person. So we can say, that's okay. We are going to replace the method that's above us. We're gonna replace the method of the parent class with the method that we write. That is fine. And that's the second paradigm we'll write it down in a moment. But there's a third paradigm that we wanna consider and that's probably gonna be best off here. What I wanna do is actually combine the two. I wanna do both what the parent class did and what my class wants to do. And that's pretty common, especially, but not only, but especially when it comes to in it. So how can I do that? How can I combine them? Well, what I can do is I can say here, person dot in it, and I'll call self a name. And you might say, wait, 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 how can we do that? Well, it turns out that in it is just a method. And it's just a method on person. And if I call it with self, my new instance of employee, and then I pass it name, what's it gonna do? Well, it's gonna assign name to self. And this is, at least technically speaking, a perfectly acceptable way to do it. But nowadays, we have a super cool way to do it. I could say super. Now, there are languages in which super means I'm going to call the method that I'm currently like the parallel method or the parent method for what I'm in. So if I'm in Dunder init, then I'm going to call in Dunder init of the parent class. That's not how it works in Python. And Python super actually returns like a proxy object that knows how to search through things. So I'm going to say super Dunder init of name. And notice, we don't need to pass self. And those of you who have been doing Python for a while will be thrilled to discover that unlike in Python 2, in Python 3, you don't need to pass the current class itself as arguments to super. Super figures that out on its own. Finally, finally, how long did it take? And so now what are we going to get? When we create a new instance of employee, it's going to look on E1 for init. It's not there. It's going to look on employee for init. It is there. That is what it runs. But Dunder init in employee then says, I'm going to reach up to the parent class and grab its Dunder init. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my little paradigm list here. And, I'm, and then we're going to mess around with it a little more. And then I'm going to take questions. So we're going to say paradigms. Do this. I'm going to say number one is do nothing use the parent's method. Number two is write a method in the subclass or child class blocking access to the parent method. And number three is write a method in the subclass, right, the child class, but call super so that you also gain the benefits and implementation of the parent class. That's basically all you can do with inheritance, right? These are the three possibilities. You can write your own method, you can use the parent's method, or you can combine them a little bit. Now, I'm not saying that these three paradigms aren't powerful. They're very powerful. But once you break it down to those three things, suddenly I think it puts things into perspective a bit. But wait a second. I haven't told you everything. Because what about this? I called it the ICPO rule. And we've seen so far instance, and we've seen so far class, and we've seen so far parents. What is this object thing? Object the class or object? What the heck is that? Well, it turns out that if you try to call a method, or if you try to retrieve an attribute for that matter on an object, we'll first go to the object, then to its class, then to the parent class. And if it's not found in any of those, it'll try something called object, lowercase o object. And that's like the top level object of our object hierarchy. Everything inherits from object. Even if you don't ask it, even if you don't tell it explicitly, Right, in Python 2, you had to tell explicitly. But if I say, hey, employee, what's your Dunder MRO? And that's the method resolution order. That's built into every class. Well, it's first going to look at employee, that's itself. Then it's going to look on person. Then it's going to look on object. And if I say, well, what's person's MRO? It's going to look at person object. What's object's MRO? It's just going to look on itself. So basically, each of these classes says, I first look at myself, then on my parent, and then we go up and up and up until we get to object. So object is where a whole lot of things are defined in Python. Let me give you an example. What if I say print P1 and print E1? Everything, but everything in Python can be printed in a print statement or print function. Why is that? Because behind the scenes, we're calling P1, well, it's actually stir of P1, which means we're calling P1.dunderstir. 
What is this dunder stir? What the heck? That's a method that's invoked every time we try to turn something into a string. Okay, so we turned to P1. Does it have a dunder stir? The answer is no. We turn to its class person. Does it have a dunder stir? The answer is no. So we turn to object. Does it have a dunder stir? Yes, it does. The reason that absolutely everything can be printed in Python, the reason that everything can be turned to a string in Python is that object defines dunder stir, which means if I want to, I can say here, def dunder stir, I can override it, right? Using one of those paradigms, using the paradigm that says that if it's implemented in the child class, then we don't go up to the parent class. And as long as I return a string from here, we're doing great. So I'll say return person named self.name. And so now if we go down here, look at this. Person name, name one, and person name, name one. How did we get this with amp one? Very simple. Because E1, we looked for, does it have it on E1? Does it have a dunder stir? The answer is no. Does the employee have a dunder stir? The answer is no. Does person have a dunder stir? The answer is yes. Can I then define my own dunder stir here? Of course I can. Def dunder stir self. And I can even do something like this. I can go kind of crazy and say, employee, well, I mean, I can, I can sort of mix them together, I guess is what I want to do. Watch, this is gonna be super ugly, but I think you'll get the idea. I can say employee ID, uh, let's say self.id number based on, and I'm just gonna say uh, super of Thunderstir. And now, oh, didn't like that, what well, I did not like. Oh, cause I didn't actually return a string syntax. What did I not do? Oh, that would do it. Ah, come back. There we go. And look at this. Now what I'm doing is I'm calling super right inside my F string. It doesn't get cooler than that. All right, I'm sure it does, but like I'm a nerd, so fine. So basically what we've got have, oh, you might be able, I do, can you just do super there? Maybe, I don't think so. Yes, no, you can't. Cause based on, cause remember super is just a proxy. Super does not actually call the method. Super is a proxy that lets you then call the method. What it does is it looks through, it searches through all those places in the MRO and then tries to apply the attribute. So if I were just to say super, it's gonna return the, like the super object here. But if I then invoke stir there, then we're okay. So there you go. So we've seen now the ICPO rule, for instance, class, parents, and object, we've seen these three paradigms that we can either not do anything, take the lazy way out, we can do something and block our parents, making them miserable and heart sick over what we've done with our lives, or we can combine things, right? Both doing our own thing. And, and always I should add, if you're gonna call super, do it at the beginning of the method so that you don't override stuff there. Oh, can you do stir on super? Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you might be able to stir on super. I'm not a big fan of, hold on, I'll just tell you in a moment what I'm not a big fan of. No, that also doesn't work because we're getting the stir of the super object, that proxy there. As a general, general rule, you're never supposed to call the dunder methods directly. You're actually supposed to just call, you're, you're, you're supposed to let Python do it. They're like callbacks where, but there are exceptions to that. And one of those exceptions is basically inside of a dunder method, you might have to call a dunder method as well. All right, so these are these paradigms. I hope this helped you to understand uh, inheritance a bit. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm actually also happy to talk, show you briefly uh, multiple inheritance if you really want, although I'm not a big fan as I'll explain in just a moment. And there you go. Questions, comments, thoughts, and so forth. Stunned silence. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for this very hands-on intro to inheritance, Ruben. Um, just as before, everyone, if you want to ask questions, please write them in the Twitch chat, write them in the Zoom chat, uh, and unmute yourself on Zoom and ask your questions. Any one of these is possible. Oh, here's one. Why are you not a big fan of multiple inheritance? So, so I'll first tell you the line that I like to use and then I'll, I'll go into more detail. So I, I like to say that um, multiple inheritance, right? There are two schools of thought on it. Some people say that it's really bad and some people say, the rest of the people say that's the worst thing ever created on earth. Um, there, there is a use for multiple inheritance. 
Um, but I think people tend to overuse it. I think people tend to jump to it as a solution, seeing inheritance as the only thing they can and should use, as opposed to looking more composition. I'm not saying that multiple inheritance should never be used, but I think people tend to um, sort of jump, jump into using it a little too frequently, a little too often. Um, I will say to, to Python's credit, in many languages, you want to avoid multiple inheritance because of what they call like the diamond problem, where you have a class and it inherits from two classes and they inherit from the same class and then you're sort of stuck. But the MRO actually has to be resolved when a class is created. And so Python will figure out if you're in an unresolvable sort of situation and it won't let you create the class as a result. So you actually, you actually shouldn't have uh, too, much, too much trouble there. The next one is from Doug. Uh, when is it reasonable to not use super dunder in it in a class that inherits from another? Oh, that is a good question. And I would say now that you're asking it that way, in, in it specifically, never. I mean, if, if you're not, in, if you're not, <laughs> if you're inheriting from a class, but you're not uh, uh, using super uh, dunder init um, to get whatever it's doing, because let, let's go back for a moment. Dunder init's job is basically to set the attributes. So if you're inheriting from another class, you presumably want its attributes. I guess, you know what, you know what, maybe you want to inherit from another class and you want to define the same attributes, the same names, but you want to define them in a different way. So the API is the same, but the initialization is different. But I agree that in most cases, yeah, you're probably going to want to, um, you know, want, want to use super dunder init there. Other methods are a little iffier, but dunder init is, I think, a, a, a good call for almost always wanting it. And Rodrigo is asking, what about class? shape and then class rectangle, class circle, yes. et cetera. Sorry, that was just a uh, the first idea that popped into mind when maybe I'll have something as a base class, but then I'm not calling the super in it because my shape doesn't have much information on itself. That was just a silly example I came up with. Right, I guess if you have like more of an abstract base class, um, then you're not gonna be inheriting its data and then by definition, and then you won't necessarily want to like, you know, run super and it's dunder in it. That's true, that's true. You see, there is no questions on Twitch. No questions. All right. Okay, then thanks again for the really entertaining talk. Um, and um, thanks for coming to Hi, Berlin, and taking your time also for questions, uh, Ruben. And My great um, pleasure. Uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much to all of you, our attendees, for joining today's uh, Hi, Berlin. Uh, and also thanks to today's speakers, uh, Doug and Ruben for sharing their knowledge with us today. And thanks to Scout B for providing us again with a premium Zoom account. And of course, thanks to our other sponsor, Manning, for making this month's by Berlin possible. Um, here's that discount, discount code again, if you want to get 30 for 35% off a book. And there will be more events coming soon. So just as reminders, uh, there is EuroPython coming up and there is by ladies munich um, coming up and um, the one day conference from manning um, api which will be online as for our next meetup uh, that will be a bit later than usual we're taking a break uh, next month but we'll uh, keep you in the loop when the next meetup will happen as always, everyone is very welcome to contribute to Fiberlin. Uh, we can always use some extra help. So please reach out if you're interested in helping us. Uh, we're also always looking for people willing to speak. So if you have an idea, uh, you can submit it by using the form under this link. Also, don't forget to spread the word about Fiberlin. Enjoy the rest of your week. Take care and see you next time.